and, we, and the teachers know, but I, when I ha we hand their exams out, there's potential I might have made a mistake. And so I'm going to go with what the answer should be in the short answers, and you're going to go through and see if I misgrade you and try to get more points out of it. Because that's your job, to see if I've missed something and, you know, you, I misread something you wrote, and we'll get more points, and we hand them in at the end of the class, and I regrade those ones that you know, people have, uh, have got questions about and usually people's grade would have improved if you have a legitimate argument about my grading. Fair enough? Okay, so I'll post those multiple choice sections this afternoon sometime on your first class board and I'm sure that's on my door as well. Alright, so carrying on today, we're going to finish today talking about this overview of the grain, hopefully, because we want to start slowing down and getting to the more detailed stuff, going over the receptors and that, that kind of stuff, but today we're going to finish off just talking about the rest, the rest of the grain, and we're basically going to be talking about the basal ganglia and the cerebrum. Okay, so the basal ganglia, and we'll talk about the cerebrum um, later on. And again, we're going to come back and touch on these areas in more detail when we go start going more slowly through some of these areas, looking at more advanced or topics on, on these areas. So the basal ganglia first. The basal ganglia are these dark pink blobs in this diagram. They're a series of deep nuclei deeper than the cerebrum. Okay, and unfortunately that they're all grey matter and they're involved in coordination of movements. We don't know a lot about them, unfortunately. What we know about them is what happens when one of them gets broken in it, really. So these are usually unfortunately you'll see in different texts different nuclei clumped into what comprises the basal ganglia. But 90% of the text will, will call these things, these various deep nuclei, part of the basal ganglia. The chordate nucleus, the putamen, globus pallidus, palatum, and amygdala, most texts will agree those are the basal ganglia. <coughs> the chordate nucleus and putamen are both together called, make up what's known as the corpus striatum, which is the largest part of the basal ganglia. <coughs> Other texts, you'll see other nuclei thrown into this mix. Like, for example, up there, um, the subthalamic nucleus is often included in the basal ganglia. The subthalamic nucleus. Um, the red nucleus is usually included in some texts. The red nucleus. And the substantia nigra. So other texts will include a more include more things, more nuclei within the basal ganglia. Particularly substantia nigra, red nucleus, subthalamic nucleus are often included, but sometimes they're not. But all texts will basically have these as the main constituents of the basal, of the basal ganglia. Of these, the chordate nucleus is the largest and probably the, probably the most important in terms of function of, of these nuclei. And I said they're involved, where we find these, uh, basically these blue things on this diagram. So, lateral to the internal capsule. The internal capsule itself is lateral to the thalamus. Okay, so this is where we find <coughs> the nuclei that make up the basal ganglia. And again, I said there's not a lot too much known about these. But we do know there are certain neural circuits that go th that link these nuclei together. And they're important in the production of movement, in the coordination of movement. And we're going to come back to this when we look at Parkinson's disease in detail. But basically there's two neural circuits called the direct and indirect pathways that link these series of nuclei to the supplementary motor area or the supplementary motor cortex, which is on the bottom of this sort of flow diagram. So the supplementary motor cortex is on the motor, is on the cortex, and this is one of the thing, one of the areas that's in really important in the internal cue to move. So, so when I want to start walking, when I get out of my chair, it's the supplementary motor cortex that gives us that impetus to get the kickstart to move. Okay, that's the internal cue to move. And these pathways influence that supplementary motor area. This is the direct pathway through these nuclei, straight down like this. Okay? 
So it's a feedback loop from the cortex, striatum, globus pallidus, the internal segments, two parts of the globus pallidus, internal and external segments, and we'll come back to this when we look at <coughs> Parkinson in detail, down to thalamus, back up to supplementary motor area. This is the direct pathway. Okay? Red on my little diagram is inhibitory. <coughs> Stop. Green is excitatory. Facilitation. Wait a minute. So, what is the effect of the direct pathway on the supplementary motor area? Is it excited or inhibited? <coughs> what does the indirect pathway do to the supplementary motor area? Sorry, the direct pathway do to the supplementary motor area? Excite or inhibit? Excite. Excite. Thalamus excites the supplementary motor area, but the globus pallidus inhibits that pathway. But the striatum inhibits the globus pallidus. So I've inhibited the inhibitor, <coughs> therefore we get facilitation. <coughs> So the direct pathway, the facilitatory pathway, try to get more information, more stimulation to the supplementary motor area. <coughs> this is the indirect pathway, coming around this way, this loop. Through the globus pallidus external segment, to the plant nucleus, like this. This is the external, sorry, sorry, the indirect pathway. I'm not going to expect to memorize this for now, I know in Saunders class you definitely have to memorize all these Parkinson's disease, but we're going to come back to this later on and we'll look at Parkinson's disease in detail. What does that pathway have? What effect does that pathway have on the supplementary motor, the indirect pathway? <laughs> Inhibitory, isn't it? If you put it backwards, thalamus <coughs> excites the supplementary motor air, globus pallidus inhibits that. So the nucleus excites the in inhibitor. <coughs> the globus pallidus external segment inhibits that. The shrike inhibits that. So you follow that pathway through logically, the direct result, the ultimate result of the indirect pathway is to inhibit the cortex. When you get damage to this, these basic ganglia, the most common damage is what? <coughs> this fellow over here. <coughs> Expansion eye, remember? Lots of dopamine. Parkinson's. That was one of the questions we had. The expansion eye that <coughs> produces dopamine which, dopamine, which is fed into this circuit with, with Parkinson's disease, as the expansion eye degenerates. You have lots of dopamine. So that feeds into this mix of circuits, <coughs> and the symptoms you'll see are going to be a mixture of positive and negative findings. Some positive and negative symptoms you'll see. In other words, a positive symptom is something you exhibit that you wouldn't normally have there. A negative symptom will be something you can't do, which you normally <coughs> could do. So give me a positive symptom of Parkinson's disease. <coughs> tremor? Resting tremor. You won't normally do that. So that's a positive. So that's a result of the, is the battle between the direct and indirect pathways. What would be a negative symptom? of Parkinson's disease. Bradykinesia. Have you, you know what I mean, uh, Have you heard the term bradykinesia? Yes? Like bradycardia, great slowness of movement. Normally they move normal speed, now they're moving slower. That's a negative symptom. There are, in Parkinson's disease, there's, there's lots of symptoms, but there are what's termed four cardinal symptoms. The four major, not the major, but they, they term the four cardinal si symptoms of Parkinson's disease. There'll be resting tremor, um, muscle rigidity, okay, stiff muscles, and what specific type of rigidity or special type you often see in Parkinson's disease? Cogwheel rigidity. And it's very, very in cool to see when you find it. It's very obvious. When you get a patient with Parkinson's disease, you try and extend their elbow, and you go duh, 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 like a jerk all the way along, like that. It's not like clasp knife, it's not um, clonus, it's very distinct, but you feel it. The, the arm is give like that. Cogwheel rigidity. So the, again, the four cardinal symptoms were, what did I say, tremors, um, rigidity, 
bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement or hard to get moving, and then later on in the disease, and you'll see postural instability. Postural in instability. Those are the four cardinal symptoms of uh, signs, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. You'll get many others, of course. Um, give me another symptom of Parkinson's disease. Shuffling gait. Shuffling gait, right? Very short stride length. We'll talk more control when we get to Parkinson's in this class. We'll talk more about how we can treat that short shuffling gait. Sometimes they'll they'll start slowly and then they'll speed up like that. You know, they'll get this jerking and they can hardly stop. Anyone know what that's called? Hoed gait. Fascination. It's like a hoed gait where they kind of just start shuffling along and they can't stop themselves. When they turn, what happens sometimes? They go in circles. They'll, they Say that again. If they go in circles, I think. Well, what they'll do is, so this is my normal turn, you know, whatever. They'll do what's called pedestal turning, like on a pedestal. So they'll walk and they'll turn like this. And off they go. And we'll talk about, we'll, I'll show you some videos, but when we talk about parking, we look at the diseases and the motor pathways later on, we'll show you some videos of a person doing that. And they'll get what's known as retropulsion gait retropulsion. So that's often seen when they will do a, a turn. So a patient starts to do a turn, and do this, and they go like that. They start walking backwards. That's retropulsion gait. Again, all linked into these problems in the basal ganglia here. Um, because the basal ganglia, uh, you can see on this diagram here, are the chordate nucleus and the globus pliers are intrinsically linked or very highly linked to the extrapyramidal pathways. The basal ganglia uh, uh, coordinate movement or responses or activation in the extrapyramidal pathways, which we know were the rubrospinal, reticulospinal, vestibular, and pectospinal. So nearly everybody got that right in the, so far. Some people gave me some other weird ones, but um, those are four major parts of the extrapanel pathways. You can see how those pathways are influenced by the basal ganglia. Um, what else? Part mask, mask-like face, hardly any expression. Faces of blank stare. Everything gets smaller. So the writing gets smaller. <coughs> What would that's called? Micrographia. Small handwriting. Small speech. Small steps. Small movements. Small everything. Everything shrinks, kind of thing. <coughs> but those, we'll come back to those Parkinson's disease, how we can, you know, I, I'll give you some tips on treatment. Obviously, in your later classes, you'll go over much more detail about the assessment and treatment of Parkinson's disease. Um, another disease, another sort of group of diseases or group of signs and symptoms you'll see with Parkinson's with basal ganglion disease these are the careers. Career. What does that mean? What's career in Latin? As in choreography? What's a choreographer do? Direct movement. Direct movement, but more than that. Organize dance, right? Dance. So this means dance. Dance like movement. That's where the term comes from. If a person with career doesn't start doing the waltz or the <laughs> jitterbug down the room, they have sort of dance sort of jerky movements of the arms and facial twitches, grimaces. <coughs> and I'll show you a video of a video of someone with career later. So jerky, involuntary, purposeless movements of the arms, extremities particularly. And the most common one of common type of career to get would be have you heard of Huntington's career? Huntington's career is a a common type of career. 
which is a very interesting disease. It's an inherited defect. It's a genetic trait people will have. They inherit inherit something as career. And it's basically um, you find defects in the in the corpus duodenum and in the cerebral cortex. And we'll talk about Huntington's career later on when we get back to the basal ganglia, I mean, the extra panel pathways in detail, but just be aware of the names of them, what basically they do. And unfortunately, strokes very commonly affect the basal ganglia. These are small, they're little small blood vessels that go into these deep areas of the brain. Those little small blood vessels coming off big blood vessels are commonly clogged by little bits of fat or whatever floating off big vessels. They go through big vessels fine, carotids, vertebral arteries, and then they get to a small vessel and they get they clog it. And then you get strokes in the basal ganglia. So that's not uncommon place to get strokes for CVAs within the basal ganglia. Very old part of the brain, old pathway emanating from here, rubro reticular, etc. etc. So it's very it's not advanced movement. It's primitive type movements and, and coordination they help with this, as in, in, with the cerebellum. This is what the, this, the cerebrum is the place where our advanced sort of movements come from. So let's look at our cerebrum, our cerebral cortex here. This is basically about 80% of your brain is this thing, this big massive cerebral cortex, a big dome that covers everything we've been talking about so far. <coughs> it's highly, it's convoluted, it's folded, right? The cortex is folded. Why do you do that? Why do you fold something? Increase the More surface area of it, right? The cerebellum is highly folded as well, much more folded than this. Because all the useful <laughs> stuff, the interesting stuff, goes on in the cortex. Cortex means what? Mm. Latin means the bark of a tree. So if you see cortex of anything, it's the outer layer surrounding something, the cortex of any organ or whatever. It's the bark of a tree, and this is the bark of the brain, as it were. It's folded, so you get more sur surface air. It's grey matter, okay? Outside the brain is grey matter. The inside of the cerebrum is white. <coughs> there are pathways beneath this cortex that take information in and out of the cerebral cortex. In the, co in the cord, of course, the grey matter is in the inside. The pathways that take stuff up and down on the outside, the white stuff, the columns, right? So this cortex is convoluted, is folded to get more surface area. And within that cortex, we can identify um, six layers of cells, six different layers. We'll come back to where, what we find in those later. But for now, there's layers within the cortex, from top to bottom, thickness-wise. <coughs> if you look at these folds, a fold, an upswelling is called a gyrus. This is all. This is. Am I going too slow? Is this just you've had this in MP? And this is boring. That's fine. Oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you have had this, haven't you? You know, you've seen terms gyrus before. It means circling grief. A sulcus is the crack, a little crack, um, that's Latin for ditch, a sulcus is a crack in the bowl, and if you see a big crack, it's called a fissure, as in the longitudinal fissure which separates the left and right hemispheres. <coughs> okay, so this left and right hemispheres are separated down the middle by the longitudinal fissure. Can get a picture of that? longitudinal fissure. But the, of course the hemispheres are connected left and right by what's the major pathway connecting left and right hemisphere called? Corpus callosum. Corpus callosum, Corpus callosum contains me most of that commissural fibers going left and right. We do have a little pathway in front and behind that called the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure, but most of the, the hemisphere is connected by these by the corpus callosum. Within the cerebrum, we have three basic types of functional pathways, or fibers. <coughs> There's three tracks 
path fibers, pathways, whatever you want to call them, within the cerebral cortex. We have what's known as projection fibers or projection tracks. Projection. Projection fibers are white. They bring stuff in to the cortex or out of the cortex. So stuff coming up to the cortex is projected onto the cortex and then stuff after we decide what to do we project pathways outwards like the cortical spinal tract for example. Remember our third order neurons are sometimes called projection neurons aren't they? They start where? Thalamus. Thalamus and go to various places on the cerebral cortex. So Those are projection neurons, projection fibers. Within a, within a hemisphere there are intrahemisphere connections, intrahemisphere connections. Those are known as association fibers or association tracks, big ones. Association fibers. <coughs> They're basically interneurons within the cerebral, within a hemisphere. And the last type of tracks, fibers you'll find are called commissural fibers. Those connect interhemisphere. So commissural fibers connect left and right hemisphere. Association fibers connect left to left hemisphere, within a hemisphere. And again, the largest of those commissural fibers are found, or most of them are found in the corpus callosum. We do have um, a anterior and a posterior commissural fibers as well. <coughs> we can do some interesting things with patients who've had their corpus callosum cut, called split brain patients, why do I cut somebody's corpus callosum? To reduce seizure? Reduce epilept epileptic seizures. Sometimes if you have a focal area of seizure starting in the right hemisphere and it spreads to the left hemisphere and basically screws the whole brain up, they'll sometimes in very severe cases, if meds don't work, they'll go in and slice their corpus callosum. So the left hemisphere cannot talk to the right hemisphere and vice versa. So that's kind of a cool thing to do in terms of experiments because then you can present something to the right hemisphere. So remember, if I'm looking straight ahead, all my left visual field goes to my right hemisphere. So I can give the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere some totally different information and see how it reacts to that. What, you know, we're trying to figure out what the right hemisphere does and what the left hemisphere does. We've got five major lobes of the cerebrum shown in here. Frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. And deep within the temporal lobe, if we peel that out, if we, if we split the temporal lobe out of there, we can see this little lobe in here. The insula, it's not as convoluted as the rest of the other lobes. The insula, or just you know that, you've had that term before. What's it called there? Uh, insula, yeah? Also, the island of Rio is sometimes called. So this image here is that shadow here is the insula, a little lobe deep within the, the other lobes. That's the insula or the island of Rio. That is your fifth lobe, and it's not usually as convoluted as the other lobes. <coughs> okay, very quickly, I'm sure you've all had this before. Stop screen anyway here. Frontal lobe, okay? Separated from the parietal lobe by the central sulcus. That crack that separates parietal and frontal lobe, that central <coughs> sulcus, sometimes called the fissure of Rolando. After, what's his name? Luigi Rolando, who was an Italian anatomist. The parietal lobe is separated from the occipital lobe by the, you can't really see it here, but little, a small fissure in there, a small um, sulcus called the parietal occipital sulcus. I'll be shown on that diagram, maybe one of these better, these ones lower down will show it, but. lobe, separated from the frontal lobe and a bit of the parietal lobe 
by this lateral sulcus, this sideways slip here, the lateral sulcus. Okay, or the fissure of Sylvius. Another name for the lateral sulcus. Thought processes sort of occur. 
occur. The personality, our behaviour, is within the frontal lobe. Higher cognition. So this is why, remember Moniz, the Portuguese neurosurgeon who came up with that wonderful treatment for psychotics? He stuck an ice pick up in the nose. Remember that? Or heard of that? And go like this with an ice pick across people's frontal lobe and it's given the person a what? Lobotomy. Frontal lobotomy. In, in the 1930s and 40s, the money of this Portuguese neurosurgeon came up with this treatment for these psychotics who couldn't, wouldn't respond to any of the treatment, basically jam a metal spike up their nose and go side to side like this and basically separate the frontal lobe from the rest of the brain. It's a frontal lobotomy. And it was very effective in, in many of these patients in curing this, these psychotic behaviour of these patients. But it made the people completely docile, completely had no social graces, they just completely out of it. Um, for example, I know, you know, I'd be sitting, I'd be talking here about frontal bottom, I'm, I want to go to the bathroom, I'll just walk over there and pee in a corner in front of you. Whatever, big deal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a person with a frontal lobotomy. There's no idea. Couldn't care less about the world around them. Um, and he, actually, Monius came over um, to America and was touring around America teaching his technique in the 1940s. It was an accepted practice to give somebody a frontal lobotomy. <coughs> and he actually, I think, in 1949, he got the Nobel Prize for medicine for this technique. <laughs> butchery obviously you know but that so what he was doing was trying to prevent this personality disorders that emanate in the frontal lobe from getting to the rest of the brain and the body one of his patients actually tried to kill him after he realized what he'd made him after he'd given his bloke a frontal lobotomy the bloke tried to kill him on his for, for doing it to him anyway um the higher animals, the more advanced animals, will have a bigger frontal lobe. You know, your, your whales and your dolphins, huge, massive frontal lobe. Personality-wise, communication, higher sense of thinking is in the frontal lobe. Um, <coughs> many of the lower animals have a very, very small cortex at all. They have hardly any cerebrum. This is the more advanced part of the brain. And if, they, if a lower animal does have a, have a cerebrum, a lot of that is that is related to smell. In low animals, smell is the most important sense and their, mot and their cortex is devoted to interpretation and use of smell. So it's kind of weird that we also have very, very weird convolu convoluted pathways for smell. It's very hard to find where smell pathways go within us. Let's look at the, the, the functions. Uh, three major functions I, I can sort of um, make up for the cerebral cortex. The three major functions that you don't find other parts of the brain doing as well. Probably the, most, the clearest one is the reception and interpretation of sensory information. Conscious perception. So our projection neurons from the thalamus go to our somatosensory cortex. We'll talk about that in a minute. But also vision, taste, smell, sound, all those special senses also get sent to various places on the cerebral cortex. Okay? And then they're interpreted by the cerebral cortex to what that means. That is a pen in my hand. That is a spider crawling up my arm. That is what? That is a heavy weight. This is a light weight. My arm is bent, my arm is extending. All those conscious perceptions are a function of the cerebral cortex. Many of our senses are sent to the cerebellum. But the cerebellum doesn't, doesn't interpret that. Doesn't, there's no conscious perception in the cerebellum. If you want to consciously perceive something, you have to get it to the, the sensory cortex or the cerebral cortex somewhere via the thalamus. So if I'm going to do lots of very fancy things with proprioceptive information very quickly, but it's not going to give you consciousness. The cerebral cortex gives you consciousness. The second major thing that the 
cerebral cortex does for us, <coughs> it organizes complex motor behaviors. Complex movements. We have reflexive and very low level movements done by the cerebellum, done by the spinal cord. <coughs> but our higher order movements, like learning to dance, learning to do a pole vault, whatever, those things are a function of the cerebral cortex. Without that, we're a very primitive animal. Very simple movements, reflective type movements. Third major function of our cerebral cortex is memory. Storage of learned experiences. We lay down memories in this cortex, distributed throughout the cortex. <coughs> okay? Let's have a look at some of those sensory areas then. Like how do we get conscious perception of something? Sight, sound, whatever. So, within the cerebral cortex, there are areas specialized to, for the reception of certain senses. Let's look at the most large of these, perhaps the most important. This yellow band here. This is our somatosensory cortex or in here it's called primary som somatostatic area or there's various terms for it but somatosensory cortex is probably the most commonly used um, this is these numbers are, when you see in circles are part of what's called Brodmann's map um, he came up with this map, map who was a French neuro neuro neurologist who labelled these areas and I think we should perhaps memorize some of these, I'm afraid. Because you do see people saying area 4, area 6, or 7, or whatever, on Brodman's map. So, I'll do, we'll just pick out a few of them as we go through. So, Brodman's map, the somatosensory cortex is 1, 2, and 3 on Brodman's map. This here. This, of course, is our post-central gyrus. Therefore, it's on the parietal lobe behind the central sulcus. Okay, something that's called the primary sensory area. <coughs> this, of course, is the area of the cerebral cortex that receives all body sensation. Everything except for our special senses, sight, sound, touch, I mean not touch, sight, sound, smell, audition, taste, whatever. Our special senses in our cranial nerves, they go somewhere else. But the rest of our body, pain, temperature, touch, proprioception, force, vibration, whatever, you name it, all our limbs, all our body, our trunk, our face, whatever it is, all ends up going to this cortex via the thalamus. Okay? <coughs> and we can see that this is somato somatotopically organized. <coughs> and that's like this little homunculus, little man with his feet hanging in the in the monitor fissure and those, the size of those that little diagram shows how much area is devoted to that part of the body it's on equal representation isn't it obviously look at the amount of space devoted to the car for example or the upper arm very very little amount of space devoted to this part of the body we are not very perceptive Se you know, our sensations are very, not very tuned, not very detailed here. But look at the amount of space devoted to the thumb and the hand, and the face. Nearly, nearly two-thirds of the whole of this cortex is face and hand. Okay? Look at the amount devoted to the lips, and the tongue. Very, very, very sensitive. You can pick out minute changes differences in, in sensation on the tongue or the lips, but you can't on the foot, for example. And you'll do like, have you heard of two-point discrimination test? So you get like a, I don't know, a paper clip, open it out and put two pieces of, you know, two pieces of wire sticking down, or two pencils. Hold two pencils together and push them onto the patient's back, one your back. Try it. Push them, two pencils on the person's back. And they have to tell you how many pencils are there. There's the one or the two you'd be surprised how far those pencils have to be apart 
on your back before you say, yeah, I can feel two pencils, not one pencil. Put them on your lips. You know, a millimeter apart, I can tell the two things on my lip, but not on my, my foot or my back or my bicep or whatever. Two point discrimination test. Because there's so much more space your lips are way more sensitive than, you know, your foot or whatever. And that's why if you on your tongue, you have a little bit of grit in your mouth, right? And you feel like a boulder stuck in your mouth, you know, it's, 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 it's you fit it out and there's a little minute speck of something. But in your mouth it feels huge, because of that, the, it's so sensitive to um, these sensations within that area. So it's so much topically organized. Body mapped, on equal representation. And remember, the anterior cerebral artery covers about this much here. I mean, at first, two, two classes, we talk about the anterior cerebral artery, does this bit here, and this bit of the cortex here is the middle cerebral artery. So we get a stroke in a different artery, we have different effects. We have new sensation from different parts of the body. Back here, as I said before, so that's that's body <coughs> sensations go along that on that yellow speckled line there. Back here, on the what's known as the pole, I forgot to mention that perhaps the very tips of the brain, front and back, are called poles. So the North Pole, South Pole. This is our occipital pole here, and right in the front is the frontal pole. But right back here on the occipital pole is our primary visual area, area 17 <coughs> on the map, or usually just called the visual cortex. Visual projection area, primary visual area, whatever you want to call it. This is where the optic nerve ends up, essentially. Retinal information goes through the optic tract, optic nerve, optic chiasm, we'll get to this later when we look at the optic nerve, but essentially this is where we receive our visual array. The, the optic, the retinal display ends up on the back of your head. Okay? The auditory reception area is right here, area 41 and 42 on Bradman's map. See how it's just beneath the lateral sulcus mm -hmm. on the temporal lobe, the primary auditory area, or auditory reception area. This, of course, is where our sounds get projected to. Okay? Now, olfactory, you can't see it there. Olfaction, the smell, gets projected onto the mid inside of the temporal lobe. You can't really see it, but sort of if I was to pull that out, that temporal lobe, peel it out, and the inside of that temporal lobe that I've shown here is our olfactory area. Taste, the last one we'll talk about, taste is at the very bottom of the somatosensory area, right down here. Primary gustatory area, or gustation, taste. Right there, number 43, on the bottom of the lateral sulcus. So each sensation has a reception area for it. We don't perceive here. We don't, we don't have perception within these projection areas. That is where the signal is received. Okay? But perception is understanding what that signal is. Okay, so to understand that, what is that thing my, on my retina? The retinal image is sent to the, the primary visual area. But we don't know what it is until we send those signals to an association area next to the projection area. So what I'm saying is, around each of these primary sensory areas, there's an association cortex, an association area. <coughs> okay? So you can see right behind 
my my sensory cortex, that's where the signal gets received, but it's then sent backwards to the association area, so my sensory so association area that perceives, interprets that signal. Okay, same with the primary visual area, there's a, an association area next to it. Same with the auditory area, you can see here, there's the primary auditory area, but around it is this association area. Okay? <coughs> and that's got a specific name for that one, or area 22. Anybody know what the auditory association area is called? It's a weird name, up for some bloke. Wernicke's or Wernicke's. That is a term for the auditory association area. <coughs> Wernicke's or Wernicke's area. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Why that's important. Okay? So, all these areas we've talked about so far, all these association areas and projection areas, are bilaterally represented. In other words, we've got two of them. We've got on both sides. We find a left and a right, a left and a right, everything. <coughs> okay? But we do have differences between the hemispheres. Okay? We do have processing deficit differences between the hemispheres. And sometimes these are a bit exaggerated, I think, in the in the literature, but very briefly, so if a patient has a left stroke versus a right stroke, you'll see different problems particularly in higher level cognitive functions. Sure, if I have a left stroke, I affect my right side <coughs> of my body. I, if I have a right stroke, I affect my light, left side of the body. But also, higher cognitive processes are affected differentially based on which hemisphere has been affected. The left hemisphere is sometimes, what, what do you know about the left hemisphere? Sort of, what do you think, in the broad terms, the left hemisphere is responsible for doing in terms of higher, higher order processes? Language. So I said most of these most of these areas are on both sides, but in language is one of those things that's only typically unilateral. The language, and we'll talk about that in the area, is only on one hemisphere usually on most people. It's on your left hemisphere. Okay, your left hemisphere for most people is your language hemisphere. It is a the logical hemisphere. It's the sequential processing, the mathematics, the language hemisphere, physics, chemistry, that kind of information is all left hemisphere. Some people say it's the dominant hemisphere. I don't know if that's true. I don't I believe that but why is roughly area on this right lateral? It's a bad diagram. <laughs> it's not correct. That's where it's supposed to be. Yeah, it's shown on the, on the right hand side on that in that diagram, isn't it? But it's not. It's, I don't know why they did that. On some people, you find Broca's area on the right hemisphere. It must have been that person they were looking at. <laughs> on some people, you find it on both hemispheres, and that's thought to be a link to stuttering. But most people have language on one hemisphere, your left, usually. Um, if you lose it you can transfer language to the right hemisphere, particularly if you're a child. If you're an adult, you're probably never going to get regain language. In a kid, <coughs> you can regain language if you lose your left hemisphere by throwing it over onto the right hemisphere. They're much more plastic. A kid's brain is an adult's brain. <coughs> <coughs> the right hemisphere, in contrast, is the artsy-fartsy hemisphere, right? <laughs> the artistic hemisphere, your cooks, your chefs, these type of people, artists, they are supposedly white hemisphere, more, use a white hemisphere more. This is our spatial abilities, spatial ability, um, parallel processing is right hemisphere. And we use both hemispheres all the time of course. Um, I, think, I think it's about 7% of people have language on left hemisphere. And what, what we'll do, what, what they term about um, hemisphere specialization is hemispheristies, they'll call it. 
hemisphericity is that you do certain things in one hemisphere and other things in the other hemisphere. So if you give me a maths question to do, I will use my left hemisphere to process that information okay, and give you the answer. If you ask me, for example, a spatial question, they'll ask, for example, go into your house or your apartment, count how many windows there are in your apartment. And you do that in your head, and that's a spatial question. You, you navigate in your head through your apartment, one window, two windows, three windows, four, blah, 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 blah. Or they'll say, for example, how many corners are there on that F? So in your head, you don't look at it, you say, imagine F, how many corners are there on that? You go, one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 blah. That's a spatial question. And we can use what's known as conjugate lateral eye movement to see what hemisphere you're using. A Clem test, I know, clinically valid, interesting, it's just as interesting, whatever, stands for conjugate <coughs> and for conjugate. Is it G or J there? I can't remember. G. G or J? J. 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 <coughs> Conjugate lateral eye movement. In other words, which way are your eyes moving? <coughs> because what you'll do is you'll, you'll look to the contralateral to the hemisphere you're using to process information. In other words, you can do it to your friend <laughs> later on. You have a patient, your person, your, your whatever, your roommate stares straight ahead of the dot. A playing card. Concentrate on that playing card. And then you ask them a math question. What's 15 plus 5 plus 7? And they'll look to the right with their eyes. They'll look up here. Because they're using left hemisphere. <laughs> if you ask them a special question, count the windows in your apartment, they look over the left hand side. Because they're using a, they're using the right hemisphere to do it. Special. So that's lateralization. People are lateralized to do certain things with certain hemispheres. Females generally are less lateralized than males. They'll have more, they'll use the hemispheres not quite as lateralized, not as distinctly as males do. Mm. Um, Is that why they're better at multitaskers? Are they? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think in the same talk at the same time. You see. <laughs> um, we did an interesting experiment with, uh, at LSU where we had people, we tried to figure out what, lat what hemisphere people prefer to use. So if you're a teacher, as a PTOT as well, you're educators really, you want to structure your information, your teaching techniques to the, what this person prefers. That's why, this is why some people prefer instructions, right, or verbal instructions. Of people that hate that, they want a diagram, they want to see it. So when, uh, when we're teaching sports skills, uh, do you like to, to see somebody do it, or do you want to get instructions on, on the skill? We had a playing card, and we had a little video camera behind a curtain, we video people's eyes, whichever way they looked. We told them whether they left hemisphere or right hemisphere, dominant, which we hemisphere are using, and then we gave them instructions to learn this skill, this juggling skill, either to help them, that was helped their dominant hemisphere or the opposite. So if this was a spatial learner, we gave them verbal instructions and they hated their juggling was worse. But if you structure their 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 in their practice conditions to the hemisphere they like to use, they were much better. So if you de demonstrate or give verbal instructions depends on how they like to process the information. We find it made a big difference on what the and the other thing we tried to do is try to have information within the learning environment that used both hemispheres. We want intra-hemisphere communication. So you want to have the best of both worlds in your teaching if you can. So people do prefer certain types of information, certain types of processes, processes and it's based on what the hemispheres are doing. And you can find out that using conjugate lateral eye movement. Kind of interesting little thing to do. <coughs> okay, let's move on. I'm slowing down here. I'm going to grab something about the aroma and stuff. Sensory, sensory areas, sensory association areas. Now we have motor areas. We have motor areas to get the information out now. Okay, and of course the most important of these is area 4 on the primary, on the precentral drivers, which is our motor cortex. Or 
from remote area. And that, just like the somatosensory area, for the somatosensory area, there's the motor area, almost identical in terms of spatial representation, somatotopically organized. Look at the huge amount of space devoted to space. <coughs> I can make infinite facial expressions compared to the leg. Look at the amount devoted to the hand. There's, in other words, there's motor nerves, there's upper motor neurons emanating from these areas, all going down to the, through the internal capsule, of course. So I've got way more motor cortex devoted to the face and the hand and the leg and the foot, the arm, whatever. So I can make much, much more detailed, fine movements, fine motor movements with the hand, the fingers, the lips, the face, than other places. Again, if I lost on my middle cerebral artery, I'm losing this area, I'm losing the hand, I'm losing upper extremity. If I lose the anterior cerebral artery, I'm losing lower extremities. <coughs> There's a special area for the eye movements. The frontal eye field here. This is what, where we control our eyes from here. The frontal eye field. And just like in the sensory areas, there's an association area next to each primary sensory area, we have an association area sort of thing for the motor areas. So in front of the motor cortex, we have a premotor cortex, or premotor area. This is where our responses are organized. The motor cortex doesn't organize responses. It is just the relay station for stuff coming out. It's the primary, the, the last, stop on the way, as it were, until that signal is sent down the corticospinal tract. So the movement is organized via the premotor area, the basal ganglia cerebrum. <coughs> Besides the pattern of effort commands we want, it's sent up to the motor cortex, the motor cortex then outputs it. If I stimulate your motor cortex, you don't throw the javelin. You bend your elbow. Okay, you make a certain movement of a certain muscle based on where you stimulate that motor cortex, and this is exactly how it was, they found this. Basically, you people are awake, you know, you do a brain surgery, the brain has many sensory receptors, and they put a grid of electrodes down onto the somatosensory cortex, or motor cortex in this case, and they'll stimulate it, and see which leg moves, and how much of a mo leg moves. It's basically exactly how you map your brain out using these stimulations, and that's how we got this map of the motor cortex. <coughs> Another important area, motor area, is Broca's area here. Right on the on the left hemisphere, in most of us, on the frontal lobe, Broca's area. This, of course, is our speech area, language speech. <coughs> if you have a lesion to Broca's area, you can't speak. You can write, you can't speak. Let's finish off by mentioning a few global lesions or global symptoms we can have with cerebral damage, cerebral cortex damage. And we're just going to touch on a few terms here, and you'll go over these way more in detail, particularly in OT, you'll do a lot of stuff on, I presume, agnosia phase and all that kind of stuff, but let's just go a few terms we'll, we'll ter symptoms we'll get if we have strokes to the cerebral cortex. I'm not looking at motor symptoms per se now here, but more higher order issues, like apraxia. Apraxia. <coughs> apraxia is something will happen, means without practice sort of thing. This is basically the inability to perform a learned purposeful action, a skill. <coughs> you might have gait apraxia, for example usually on a frontal lobe. If you damage the frontal lobe, you often will get apraxia. <coughs> means I, I can control my arms, I, I'm not paralyzed. I can do a bicep curl, I can kick my leg out, but I can't put those motor movements into doing a move, a skill. I lost the ability to figure out how to do a skill, like walking or feeding myself. That's an apraxia. These can't put movements together to do a skill. 
know is a God or not doesn't, doesn't know. Gnosis is knowledge. So agnosia is something they don't know. They don't know what that thing is. Agnosia without knowledge. So you you look at so the visual cortex is fine, for example. I look at this green thing, I don't know if it's an apple or a tennis ball, or I've no idea what that thing is. I just can't interpret that thing. The famous book was written by Oliver Sacks, remember the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Look at his wife, he thought his wife was a hat. <coughs> You just don't know what that thing is. Okay? And you can have visual agnosia, you can have tactile agnosia. Visual agnosia, I don't know what that thing is visually. If I put it in my hand, yeah, it's a bunch of keys. So I can feel, I, I know it is by touch, but when I look at those things, I have no idea what they are. Or vice versa. I can look at them, I can see their keys, and you put them in my hand and behind my back, I have no idea what they are. I have tactile agnosia. You just don't know what you've got based on those things. And again, this is often the right angular gyrus is some of the is a, a, a location. Many of these strokes are patients with agnosia. The right angular gyrus. Where is that? <coughs> Remember that this thing here I'll show you the gyrus. Angular gyrus going around the corner of the lateral sulcus. Um, Last thing I want to mention. A severe form of agnosia is called neglect. Have you heard of neglect? This is where patients completely neglect one side of the body. Neglect is a very severe form of agnosia. Usually a patient with neglect, or every patient I've seen with neglect, has had a right hemisphere damage. So it's therefore it's a left sided neglect. Have you seen a patient with neglect? It's pretty weird. They will, you ask them to draw a clock, and they'll, they'll draw, they'll draw the, I mean, you put a circle, you put, write the clock in, <coughs> and they'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they'll stop at six. They'll stop. They will shave the right side of their face. They can, don't know they've got a left side of the face. They completely not shave the left side. Or they eat the food off the right hand side of the plate, and all the food on the left hand side of the plate is left there. They do not believe there's a left side of the world. Very weird symptom. Sometimes called hemineglect. We'll talk about it later perhaps. But in severe cases, they've tried to cut their arm off. They think their left arm is alien. They do not believe the left side of the world. So this weird thing here is not mine. And there have been cases where they've tried to amputate the limb because they think this is some alien being stuck to my body, I better chop it off. And they'll try to cut their arm off. Very, very severe case of neglect. They just do not believe the left side of the world exists. Is this angular gyrus damage? Angular gyrus, right hemisphere. Yes, yeah, severe cases. Neglect the left side of the world completely. So do they understand that other people can? I mean, are they capable of getting that there are two sides, even though they can't? Sometimes not. I mean, they're just a severe brain damage. It's not severe. Right, yeah, they, they just don't perceive there's anything over here. And we'll talk about... Alright, we've had enough, yes? <laughs> I'm neglecting this part of the class. <laughs> well, very excited, I'm sure.